we deserve to make a load of money. We are doing a really complicated, risky job. I've really been into personal development. I've got ADHD. A lot of it's a bit of a superpower. There's no stopping me. When I was 17, I bought a house with a mate of mine, did the house up, bought another one, did, did it up, bought another one, bought another one, realized shit, like I can do deals, you know, worth a lot more than I've actually got the money to deal. This is way more complex than I thought. They're focused on making themselves look good, but they're just not good enough at, at finding and creating the right deals. So knowing how to add maximum value to a bit of land is the number one skill. I am right about this. I've been doing it for 39 years now. And I'll tell you one final other little interesting thing. That is really the secret of property development. Hello everybody and welcome to another episode of Property People. Today I am absolutely delighted to be joined uh, by Mr. Paul Higgs. How are you today, Paul? I'm good. Good. Very pleased to have you. Um, and I'm going to go into your intro, which is one of the um, more fun ones that I had to, to re read and prepare. You're an expert in land, planning and development, CEO, founder of Milbank Land Homes and Academy. Uh, you're a chartered planning and development surveyor, land specialist and developer with 39 plus years of hard-earned experience in construction and house building, um, including a very severe kicking from RBS in 2008, um, which nearly wiped you out, which is quite uh, impressive in itself. You're also a founding investor and director of the industry-leading prop tech company Land Insight, a part of Land Tech. And throughout your career, you've purchased, gained planning for, and built over 7,000 homes and two and a half million square foot of commercial uh, real, uh, real estate space, and becoming an award-winning developer in your own right. Most recently, you've just completed an impressive development that everyone else found impossible, which incorporates biophilic design and building with nature, all of which easily make you, in my opinion, one of my favorite developers that I've come into contact with through my career. So I'm very, very happy to hopefully share some insights with all that experience with the, uh, with the audience that we've got at Property People. Thanks, it's a, a big intro. Indeed, indeed. So let's get into the detail of it. But before we do, I always like to find out who, a little bit more about the person behind all of these achievements. Um, who were you at school? What type of person were you? Did you enjoy school? Were you academic? Were you rebellious? Did you always know you'd want to be a, like become a property developer? Blimey, that is a uh, it's an interesting question actually, and and I'm just about to announce something that I haven't told many people. So I actually discovered about six months ago that that I've got. ADHD, yeah, which, which which I didn't actually even know or believe was a real thing. Actually, I I I, I thought it's a, a whole load of bullshit made up by pharmaceutical companies to sell people more shit. Yeah, but it is a it is a real thing, and uh, and I've got it. And now knowing that, I mean, I'm literally 56 years old. Found out six months ago. Now knowing that, having looked into it a lot. Um, it makes a whole ton of sense in terms of stuff that's happened in my life, including not paying attention at school, not doing any exams, literally bunking off and going fishing, and um, and being really um, hard to be told what to do. So, so basically, at school, I, I, I basically I messed around, um, didn't do any exams. Uh, didn't pay attention and left with no qualifications. Wow. Was there even one subject that you kind of enjoyed that you look forward to or they were like... Or like yeah. Art. I was going to say art. Yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, so art, which is interesting actually because, you know, I, I've ended up in property development, which is actually a... Quite creative. A massively creative business, really. Massive, massively creative. creative. Absolutely. So how did you go from not being interested in school, not getting any qualifications, to property development? What was the route from there to yeah. there? So, so whilst I didn't like 
doing what I was told. I mean, I think that was that was a big problem, really. You tell me to, to do something, I'm I'm I don't I'm not going to do it. I'm going to do the opposite. Yeah. So there were, but there were some things I was into, like I said, art, and also I think I must have had a reasonable brain. Um, if and when you could get me interested in something. And I was also a bit of a, a real grafter. You know, I sort of my mum and dad, old school working class and stuff like that. So I always wanted to work, work and always wanted to make money, but I never really knew how and, 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 and where, yeah? So uh, messing around at school, ended up working on the building site as a labourer. Wow. Couple of months into that, uh, developers... T- turned up a couple of Range Rovers pulled in the gates and uh, obviously the guy Mr Biggs got out started walking around <laughs> and, uh, and I thought wow blimey that looks good right that's <laughs> it I'm going to be a property developer so, that, so that was it really and then so when you thought okay right I'm going to be I'm going to be one of those guys owning those Range Rovers I'm going to be rocking up to site in that way um, what did you then go and do to try and find out how they because I like I guess the next question is, how do I get there? Yeah. And so totally. what sort of research were you doing? Well, where, how did you go about your business to, to, to find the route to get there? Yeah, totally. Good, excellent question again. So now I now know what with the whole ADHD thing is that, you know, one of the, there's all different versions, right? It's not just one thing, but, but one of the, and it's not all bad, you know, some, a lot of it, it's a bit of a superpower really. So, yeah. you know, if and when I am super focused and I want to do something, it's, there's sort of like no, no stopping me, yeah? So the second I decided that I wanted to be a property developer, that was it, right? I know what I want to do now. Anything and everything, you know, I need to know, do, learn, study, I'm, go- I'm going to do, yeah? So straight away, then, I, I didn't, I, you know, I did, obviously had no idea what property development was all about. I thought, right, okay, it's about building things. It's about construction, right? I'm on a building site, now on a building site. We're obviously building stuff. I need to know all about construction. So because I was always a grafter and a good worker, um, I got on quite well with my, with my sort of bosses. And I, and I started, like, saying can I help the site engineer? So, you know, the guy with the stuff on the tripod, yeah, yeah, yeah. the field light, the dumpy level and all the rest of it. And they said, yeah, yeah, no problem. So I, I started helping the, the engineer. That job is called a chain boy, right? That's not as kinky as it sounds. <laughs> but but a ch- a ch- if you may or may not know, a chain is actually a unit of measurement, yeah? So in the old and old and olden days, the chain boy was the guy that used to carry these big heavy chains for the surveyors. And they used to lay them all out in line to, to measure stuff when they were building roads. I yeah? did not know that. So it's like a historic thing, yeah? So I was, a, I was a chain boy, basically a site engineer's assistant. So I wangled myself a job as a, a site in, engineer's assistant, um, and, I, and I was super keen. I was always asking questions. I must have been a real pain in the ass, to be honest. Like, well, I wanted to know everything about everything. I wouldn't shut up. Like, how did you do that? Why are you doing that? What, what's all this about? So, so after about six months, they said, look, you know, you're obviously super keen, and I was a grafter, and it was like, you know, you asked me to do something, I'll like literally get it done just, just like that. No, no whinging, no complaining. You know, I was, I was a super hard worker. So after about six months, they actually said, look, do you want to, would you, would you, would you want to go to college? We sort of like sponsor you um, to learn to be a site engineer. So I was like, yeah, fantastic. So, so that's what I did. So basically I, I, I became a trainee site engineer. I did an HNC. I studied construction management. And then, um, when I was 17, I bought a house with a mate of mine, and we did it up at, he, he, was, he, was, he was a bricklayer. I actually, we, we went to night, bricklaying night school together as well, right? So I'm working in the day, going to college um, one day a week to be a, learn to be a site engineer. Um, and then at night school, we're going doing bricklaying, yeah? I was terrible. Like, luckily enough, I suppose, in, in hindsight, he was actually really good. So he became a, a bricklayer. I became a, a site engineer. But we bought a house together, and evenings and weekends, for about two years, we, we were basically doing it up. So that's sort of how, how I got started. So that was your property develop- that first property development with a mate, chipping together, but both with, with a construction background. And how did that development go? Did it, uh, did it, you, know, you said it took two years? It probably took a bit more, to be honest, but probably two, two, two and a half years, because we were only, you know, we were doing it up. It's a bit of a wreck of a house, um, evenings and weekends, so you didn't, you didn't really so you have do that all the work time. yourself, you wouldn't Yeah, we did everything. Wow. Ab- absolutely everything, yeah. And what, what year were we talking this was? That, I think, was, let me work it out. 
Uh, it's about 1984, I think. So once you're in this position where you've done all this work and you've got a nice pretty house, did you, did you keep it? Did you sell it? We kept it. Kept I've it. Still, I've still got it. And you've still got it. Yeah, yeah. And, that, uh, and so then the leap, okay, being a chain boy, being kind of an on-site assist, uh, engineer's assistant, um, you finish this property development, then what's the next step? So, right, so, so did the house up, bought another one. Did, did it up, bought right, another one, right, bought right, another right, one, right, right, right. bought a house, split it into flats. So, so gradually, gradually started doing slightly bigger stuff, yeah? Um, but what happened as well, so, so in the, it, we, most of our stuff we were buying from auctions. Right. Yeah? Now, in those days, auctions were like totally different to they are now. They were a bit sort of like dark, smoky rooms, all a bit underground. Not a lot of people knew about them, yeah? So you did, you used to get, get, used to get some quite good deals in, in auctions, yeah? Now, of course, everyone knows about them. It's, it's not the same. You know, I, I, I pretty much, I don't, I've not bought anything in an auction for years. I've sold things in auctions, yeah? But I, 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 I would... Which I tells you a little bit about whether it's better to buy or sell, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. So, so anyway, at the time we were buying things in in the, in the auction, and now and then from estate agents. Yeah. So basically, all things that were on or in the market, re, re, really. Yeah. But nevertheless, you know, they were all right deals. We made a few quid. We gradually built up to slightly bigger stuff. Yeah. But every now and then, in in our sort of little patch in West London, where where I where I grew up. Um, you know, every now and then, someone will be like building a little block of flats or a couple of houses and all the rest of it. And they'd been nowhere near an auction, nowhere near an agent, and, and all of a sudden, I'm like, shit, how did I miss? Who's doing that in my patch? And yeah. I missed it, yeah? So I started investigating that a little bit and, and then became aware of the concept of off-market deals where you sp learn to spot stuff that's got potential, approach the owners direct, get a foot in the door and hopefully end up doing a deal. Yeah, so I thought, well, that's interesting. So I started, started doing that. I also started becoming aware of the importance of planning, yeah, and, and started learning, learning about that. And in those days, there was no training, there was no courses, so sure. no, no, no nothing. All you could really do is read pretty dense, boring planning textbooks and stuff like that, which I did. And, and then, and actually, this, here's a real, like, a big one. A couple of years later... I also I stumbled on a book about option agreements, yeah. Which well, now that was a massive eye opener. So now all of a sudden I've I've realised shit. Like I can do deals with you know worth a lot more than I've actually got the money to deal to do. So like it might be I don't know, I'm going to say five hundred grand. Five hundred grand was a lot of money thirty five years yeah, ago, yeah? yeah. And and you know it, i might not have 500 grand or a million quid to slap down on the deal but i started to realize actually wow i can i can tie up on an option agreement add some planning value to it and then and then and then do it so so that so those f things off market deals adding planning value and option agreements were combined was a real sort of like eye opener which sort of Put me, sent me to the next level, really. Yeah, so once you're doing these refurbs and then you're splitting them, so when you're splitting houses into flats back then, did you have to take it through planning permission f to do that? Yeah. And that was your first kind of taste of like the whole planning system as well, but then you start learning a bit more about what you could do with planning and then the option agreements. And you said you re read a book about it? Is it, was that like, how did that come about? The book, I just, I'll tell you what it was, because I, I think also I was really always been pretty like entrepreneurial and like wanting to know stuff. I think it was in the Sunday papers. You used to get these like little ads of like money making schemes yeah, yeah, and things. A lot of it, most of it, was bullshit to be honest. But I read, um, I saw this advert um, one day. It said like big profits from building plots. So wow, that was interesting, right? So so that was it. And basically, it was a, it was a book about option agreements. Interesting. So your. Um and just, just so you know as well, because I know people will go looking. It doesn't exist anymore. You, you can't find it. The, I mean, you could, you're welcome to Google it, obviously, but, 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 but yeah, it doesn't exist The people anymore. that created it probably wanted to take it out of the circulation to try and stop everybody from nabbing all the option agreements that they probably were Well, finding. I don't know. The, the guy that wrote it uh, died, actually. So, so um, but anyway. Part of your career, which I've actually 
didn't put into the intro was that you ended up working for one of the major house builders in the country. And how did, what, what was the stepping stone from doing your own developments to actually deciding, you know, I want to be part of a bigger machine and, and, and learn from them, I guess. Yeah. So, so, so what happens is, like I say, since that day I decided I wanted to be, be a property developer, I was super keen, you know, reading, learning, talking to people, you know, want, I was, that was it. I, I, you know, it was like, that was my whole life, right? I'm, I'm massively focused. I'm going to be a property developer. I want to be the best one I probably pro, pro, um, possibly can. So I need to learn as much as possible, yeah? So, and then what basically happened, as time went on, so probably by now I'm going to say, once I sort of started getting to my early 20s, I, I started realising how much I didn't know. Yeah, so you, I don't know if you know in training and stuff, there's whole, this whole thing about you start off with um, unconscious incompetence. Yeah, you don't know what you don't know. Yeah, and, and, there, and then there's a couple of different steps and you eventually get to the bit whereby you get conscious um, incompetence. Yeah, so basically you, you realise there's a load of stuff that you don't know. Yeah. It's like known, unknown, and unknown, unknown, and all that. But then it might be something like that. And eventually, hopefully, you, you end up with unconscious competence. Yeah. yeah, yeah. You don't know what, you, know, you just do it. You just know it. Yeah. So that was it. Anyway, so I'd got to the point of unconscious. No, hang on. I'll get my man. I'd got to the point of conscience, conscious incompetence. So I'd started realizing, like, yeah. fuck. This is like a big. There's a. This is way more complex and detailed than I thought it was. Yeah. So, and I did everything I could to try to, you know, learn what I re now realised I needed to learn. So, so, but eventually, I thought actually th this is like way big. Yeah. So, the only way I'm probably going to learn it is to actually get a job with a big developer that 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 that, that knows it. Yeah. So, I thought, okay, I need to get a job with a big developer. What do I need to do to get a job with a big developer? So I, you know, I probably need to get qualified. And what is the job that I need to get? Yeah. So I did a whole load of research, a whole load of talking to people, came to realise that when it comes to development, it really is all about land. Every, everything starts with land. So, let, so you know, that could be the, the, the building, the opportunity. It's basically the canvas to which you add value. Yeah. So, so, so I worked out that the most... Input, the best thing I could probably do is learn to be a land buyer, yeah, for, right. for a big developer, right? So, thought, okay, what do I have to study in order to be a land buyer? I came to the conclusion that it was land economics, yeah? Different courses do different things. Sometimes it's called estate management. Basically, so surveying, yeah? yeah, yeah I yeah. nearly studied town planning, but came to the... Uh, it's worth saying this, actually, because a lot of time people ask me this, particularly young people, about what to study, yeah? yeah. In fact, someone asked me this the other day. And they were going to go and study planning. And I basically said, uh, and this is a conclusion I came to, look, planning's good and it's, a, it's brilliant stuff. You need, to, you need to know it. But in terms of planning courses, certainly if you want to be a developer, it's, a, it's too narrow, yeah? Sure. Where, whereas what I did, land economics, lots of just different courses, they do, do similar, similar stuff. The course I did is now called estate management, actually. Um, it's 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 wider, so it's more general property and property as well. Most West End surveyors they would have all studied land economics or um, state or estate management or some, something like that. Yeah, so I studied land economics, but I chose all of the the sort of bits, the add-ons that were all planning stuff because I wanted to be a developer. Yeah, so so I studied land e economics, but did a whole load of planning stuff. Yeah, so. Um, did that? That was five year sandwich degree, so that's like. It, it was it was full time, but you probably know you know you get a couple of days off a week. So on my days off, so I'm still doing deals, I'm still doing development stuff. But as it's but I'm you know I'm slowly slowly doing bigger things as I'm learning learning more. Yeah. So eventually fin finished that. So got a degree in land economics, became a chartered planning and development surveyor, so RICS, um, and then started tapping up all of the house builders to t try to get a job as a, as a land buyer, yeah? I, so I, I wrote to them all. I specifically wanted to get a job with Lang Homes because they were renowned in the industry for, for having the very best training, right? Luckily enough, I did get a job with Lang Homes. So uh, that was fantastic um, experience and training. Luckily enough, my boss, 
the land director, a bloke called Rob Munro, who is fairly, he's way retired now, but he's pretty infamous in the industry. If you were in the you know, big developers world and land buyers, you'd know Rob or know of him. Um, so he was an amazing teacher. So I got really super lucky there that I had a brilliant teacher as well. I was la um, with Langs for five years, eventually got headhunted by Barrett's and ended up with Barrett's for five years, biggest, biggest developer in the country. So, so whilst I ended up working for PLCs for, for 10 years, that was never actually the plan. I only wanted to get the job in order to get the experience, yeah? But I ended up becoming a really good land buyer. And if you're a really good land buyer, you're literally worth your weight in gold because, oh, yeah, you know, yeah, any... Yeah, yeah. Big small development business, big development business. If you haven't got the right deals, the right land to start with, doesn't matter. You know, everyone's unemployed if you're not tying up the right deals on the right terms to start with. Yeah. So I became a really good land buyer, and therefore, you know, every time I went to resign to go and do my own thing, I got big pay rises, big promotions, <laughs> and so it, it, it was hard. So it took me basically ten years to to escape the world of corporate bullshit. <laughs> and um, and start doing my own thing again, you know. And I mean, some people they when they go down the route of doing their own development or doing their own business, then they'll say I'm unemployable and this that and the other. But you managed to make it work for ten years. It sounds like any team that you've kind of been part of, you've found a way of making it work and being valuable and en enjoying it and learning is something that I'm kind of getting yeah, from you is that you're yeah. constantly wanting to soak up more information and seeing how you can apply it. Yeah. What's the biggest? industry myth that's out there in your opinion the biggest industry myth or like what do you see people doing when they think this is the way to do it um, but actually it's counterproductive or even wasteful in their approach well i tell you one of the things i do see a, l a lot of people you know talk about branding and, you know, making yourself look good and, and, and also, you know, funding and getting a hold of the money and all the rest of it. So they're, they're, fake, they're focused on making themselves look good and getting hold of the money, but they're just not good enough at, at, the, at the detail of finding and creating the right deals. I mean, you know, that, that, so they're, li they're literally looking at things the completely wrong way, in my, in my opinion, sure. right? And... and Oh, I mean, I am right about this because it's. I've been doing it for thirty-nine years now. Yeah, everything starts with land. It starts with the building, the opportunity, finding the real deal. Ideally, a hundred percent properly off market. Yeah, and then adding maximum value to it. That that is really the secret of property development. And what's the? I know you talk about it because we know each other. But what's the fascination and the reason behind that you're as fixated on off-market deals as a lot of people say, oh, I find all my deals on Rightmove. You don't need to do this, that, and the other. We had a guest on that came on earlier today, and he said, my preferred route is still auctions. All right, they're, still, you know, they're not what they used to be, uh, but you can still look at this 4,500 lots that come up every single month. There's a deal in there somewhere. Um, I know that you're a massive, huge fan of the off-market strategy. Why do you feel that that's the best way, in your opinion? Yeah, so so it's 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 two things, right? And and I, and by the way, so I'm not saying that you can never get the deals in the auction, right? Because you can. But of course, in order to, you know, you need to know how to spot them, and you need to know where there's an, an angle or an opportunity that hopefully everyone else has missed, right? So so the price doesn't get silly, um, and where there's an opportunity for you to add massive value, right? So. You know, property development is a risky business. There's, like, no doubt about it, right? The reason you can make a, potentially a lot of money at it is because it's high risk, high reward, yeah? Sure. So it's definitely not get rich quick. So, so, and it's, and, you know, and there's a lot that can go, can go wrong that's out of your control, however clever you might think you are, particularly the market and the economy. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. And, and because depending on whether you're flipping stuff or building stuff, it's a fairly long cycle. So, you know, it's really easy to come unstuck, okay, for, for, all, for all sorts of reasons. So, 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 as a result, you've got to be tying up stuff and buying it on the right terms, yeah? So, the last, you know, 
this is right. So proper off market, z ideally zero competition, right? Um, so you're not overpaying before you've even started, right? You then add a load of planning value through, and I say planning, so planning design, it's sort of interrelated, yeah? So coming up with the best scheme um, and the best planning that's going to maximise the, the value of that opportunity, yeah? And, th and then, so if you're flipping it, right, you, you, you could flip it for a load of money because you've added all of that value. And if you're building it, Right, you you created a big buffer and insurance policy for yourself, yeah. Because because you you haven't paid too much for it to start with, and you've added a load of planning value before you've even started. So basically, it's insurance, really, in 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 one way. You you're you're adding value at every stage, at the land stage, at the planning stage, and and then of course at the build stage. Stage. Conversely, for some people, if you only buy, you know, I know people that only buy sites with planning. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Or I know of people because. Most certainly people that I teach or train or advise, right, don't buy stuff with planning. Because, you know, if you do buy stuff with planning, it's always going to be expensive. There is no such thing as an off-market site that's got planning. Almost by definition, it's, yeah, you know, it's got yeah, planning. It's in the public domain. Guaranteed, people will know about it. People will be looking at it. Generally, a lot of people, there will be competition. You're never going to buy a good site that's got planning cheap, right? Yeah, yeah, of course. So... So you're sort of up against it before you've even started, Could, yeah? And then you've only got the build bit, really, to get your profit out of. And that's actually the slowest, riskiest, most time-consuming bit. And when you've got, um, I guess, competition and those people are driving the price up and there's this old phrase where you make your money on the way in, you know, you make your money on the, on, on the buying side of it um, and that hedges your risk at the back end. If you're competing with other people, then you're obviously going to be paying more than you really should be. So trying to find something that's got that zero competition is going to be the only way. Now, for somebody to do that, they've got to start doing letter campaigns and canvassing, and they've got to start using things like um, technology, which is now available through people like yourself who put together things like uh, Land Insight and Land Tech, which are becoming more and more commonplace. Um, you didn't have those tools when you started. How were you doing it before Land Tech and Land Insight and, and, and the various companies that are providing those services existed? Yeah. So again, again, coming back to this ADHD thing, yeah, it's um, like say, looking back, I've so much makes sense, yeah? So because once I decided I wanted to be a property developer, that, yeah, I was, I was totally focused on that. Honestly, it was, it was, is, not so much nowadays, to be honest, but but f certainly for th 25, 30 years, it's like all I did, all I thought about it, I was I was crazy about, it, yeah? So I studied, read courses, studying a a anything and everything I, 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 could, I, could, I could get, right? So m my angle for, for finding and doing deals, I was just always, and still I'm really, really like super detailed, yeah? So like in the olden days, you, you know, you, you, there was, you know, there was, there wasn't even Google, right? There was, there, there, there was like, <laughs> I used to have to like, comply me. You, you used to go down the library. They used to have big, gigantic AO size um, ordnance survey maps. Yeah, so you said I have to go down. This was like thirty five years ago, thirty odd years ago. Yeah, to so go down the library. Um, get the OS map out and literally search around looking for sites, big chunks of land. Yeah, obviously land assemblies is one of the things I've done loads of over the years, you know, like big back gardens and stuff like that, chopping them up. So, so, so you go and get the OS maps, um, spot sites, yeah, and then what you'd have to do, probably, I shouldn't really say this, right? You'd have to wait till lunchtime when the librarian went to lunch because you weren't allowed to copy the maps because they had crown copyright, yeah? <laughs> Take a load of copies of the map, photocopies of the bits of the map that you want where, where there's a whole load of sites, yeah? You then used to have to mark them up, send it to land registry in, in the post, yeah? After about a month, they'd send it back to you, right? Oh, is it this bit? They'd send you like a copy of the index map. Yeah, that's a bit of the map that's got all of the different titles marked on it, yeah? And you'd then say, no, it's not that one. It's this one, this one, and this one. So basically, it'd take you about two months to find out who owned a bit of land, yeah? 
So, you know, I w you would do that, find out who the landowner was, approach them direct, write to them in a r very specific way, you know, what you say and what you don't say is really, really important. So that, that was just the site finding bit or one of the site finding bits. Now, obviously, you can drive down the road and spot a bit of land that you, that you think has got potential as well, but you still need to find out who owns it. Obviously, you can go and knock on the door. And that's a whole nother big conversation about whether that's the right way to, or not. What do you think? Do you think that's the right way to do it? Most of the time, no. It's totally the wrong way. Why? Because it's too intrusive. Uh, you, you, you know, what, what you're trying to do, like, basically, I, like, reverse engineer everything I, I do. And, like, bear in mind, I have, I have met, like, literally thousands and thousands and thousands of landowners over the years. The amount of meetings with landowners I, I must have had. There was a time, you know, when I was finding and digging out off-market sites on an industrial scale, which I don't do anymore, I, I, I probably had five landowner meetings every day of the week wow. for 10 years, probably for 20 years, actually. Seriously, right? So I've, I've met a lot of landowners. I've had a lot of conversations. I've sort of reverse engineered and honed and worked out what works and what doesn't work, yeah? The short answer to your question is just going and knocking on the door, generally, is just too intrusive. Now, unless you... Are, God, I don't know what to say. Well, I'm not going to say... Women... Right, I, I know some really good land agents. W women tend to be able to are better at being able to do it. I think probably because they're less threatening. Sure, that makes yeah. sense. They break the yeah. ice a little bit easier. Like, like, let's take it the other end scale. I, in fact, funny enough, I, I know a, a guy, a bloke that used to do it. Right, a really good wheeler dealer, land agent, um, and and a bit of a trader actually. Used to tie things up himself. This was a little short, stocky bloke, um, bald head. Tattoos on his knuckles, gold chain. I don't know how he did it. He was good. Maybe he just scared people. Yeah. <laughs> if he knocked on your door, you would shit yourself, <laughs> right? But but he was really good with a chat. Yeah. But you sort of get the point. It's not you know you got to be really good to be able to knock on someone's door unexpected when they might be in the middle of who knows what, and 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 actually turn it into a deal. So I I, I I've just found. It's just not the best way to do things. So the letter, yeah. letter dropping. So you'd get get the uh, land registry, send you the um, the who owns the property, then you write to them, and then hopefully you'll get a response. Yeah. And with that, you'll be so. I mean, all of that sounds like an absolute headache um, and very long winded. So you've really got to enjoy doing it to be able to stick with it. But uh, and nowadays, literally a couple of clicks of a button, and with three quid, you know, on your credit card, you can download the stuff. What that does bring in my mind, though, is that actually back then there was probably not a lot of competition because now everyone can get access to it. So, so it's, it's, it's a really good point, yeah. Because there was a, a, a developers meeting that I was at yesterday and some people around the table were saying it used to be a lot easier to be a developer or it's never been as difficult as it is today to be a developer, especially with everything getting stuck in planning. Based on the fact that you, you're an active developer then and now, what's your opinion? Do you think it's actually got easier or do you think it's actually harder? Planning is worse than it's ever been, yeah? And um, it, that's just how it is. Without a doubt, planning is, is worse than it's ever been. Um, all of the other stuff, I say it's worse than it's ever been. It, yeah, it, the, the system is, is worse than it's ever been, yeah? But it's like anything. If you've got good at sussing it out, then I guess, you know... It get it gets easier. Depends on depends on your experience, really. So so just to sort of jump back a bit, that in the olden days, that was like finding getting a foot in the door on a site. That's how how you you you'd sort of have to do it. But even then, once you've got a foot in the door on the site, you and this is the other sort of key. It, it's like, well, okay, how do I turn it into a deal? Yeah, exactly. right. And and the, the basically what that means is maximizing the land value. Yeah. So coming up with the scheme and the design that's gonna maximize revenue and minimize cost and actually get planning permission, yeah? Now, if, you, if people if you just go for easy planning, right, you'd never get a deal to stack and you'd never buy anything, yeah? Conversely, if you go for too crazy, stupid planning or you don't know what you're doing, you're never going to get planning permission, yeah? So, so knowing how to add maximum value to a bit of land is really is the number one skill of a developer, yeah? So you've got to find the off-market sites 
to start with so that you don't get involved in stupid competition. Because when you do, basically what happens, you end up bidding your profit margin away before you've even started. Yeah. But the real key is adding maximum planning value to land. And most so-called developers are really not very good at that, which, which is why they get refused all the time. And, that's, and the skill set really is um, a cross between understanding uh, planning case law and po planning policy and architecture and design? It's a ton of things. So, so that's why, again, now looking back in hindsight, me being so detailed, I now realise how that's worked out so well for me, yeah? Because, you know, back to the planning bit, right? You'd then have to, you'd have to go to the planning office to search the planning history of a site, go into some dusty room, dig through a whole load of boxes, find some microfiche, yeah? Go through them like, and find that it, like every, everything was massively slow and painful. But I know that nearly all the competition weren't doing that, yeah? They weren't as detailed yeah, yeah, yeah. as me. So that was my uh, angle. Like I say, I studied everything. I got really good on law. I know covenants inside out. So, you know, remember I was a site engineer, so I was really good on construction. So basically, I just made sure, I just got really, really good on, 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 on all of the everything. numerous complex things that you have to know about in order to get a deal done and maximise the land value. Yeah, because there's somebody that told me as well that, like, actually you can design a scheme that will get through planning and it's really great, but when it actually comes to delivering it, You've built something that's like the co the cost is just crazy, so it doesn't to stack. To totally, and I and I and I, I, I literally see it all the time. And it, yeah, this is one of the problems actually when you get like wheeler dealer traders that that have never built anything, because because you know one that, look, I flip a lot of stuff, I build less nowadays, yeah. But whether I'm flipping it or building it, I'm designing it to be optimally yeah, efficient yeah. to build. Because that's the way you maximise the land value anyway. Yeah, whether I'm building it or whether I'm going to flip it, yeah? Conversely, you design it all wrong. Everyone's, yeah, everything. They get the wrong unit sizes. They get the wrong mix. They get the wrong layouts. They literally get everything wrong. A lot of people, see, seriously. And, and, you know, and then they approach the whole planning application the wrong way as well. Like, and then they, then they wonder when they, why they get refused. Most people, most applications I see are literally asking to be refused. And then there's the PD thing that comes into play, which I, it could be part of the reason why he said it's, um, it's never been harder to plan, or the planning, what was, I forgot the phrase you said, but literally planning yesterday was discussed. It's impossible. The delays are just so infuriating and they frustrating. Are, yeah. um, but then they've brought out all this PD stuff. And you and I have discussed it in the past as well. Some of those PD schemes are not necessarily the most attractive. The guy that was uh, speaking here earlier today said pretty much the same thing. Um, and they're the slums of tomorrow, basically. To totally. Uh, especially with some of the room sizes that you were getting before the minimum standards were coming out. Um, do you think, I mean, we've got an affordable housing crisis. The planning system is a mess. I think there was one point that finding funding was the issue, but that's to a certain extent been resolved. There's a lot of funding out there from private debt, Homes England, et cetera. So it seems to be we're stuck on this planning thing and we're supposed to be building 300,000 new homes a year since 20 years ago and we're nowhere near and apparently it's now at 500,000. So, yeah. and the government wants to build, uh, or at least, sorry, the Labour government that of, of tomorrow, if they get in, want to build a million homes. In your opinion, why are we in this mess and how do we get ourselves out of it? So, I mean, the reason we're, the, the biggest problem at the moment is the resourcing of the planning system, yeah? There, there are just not enough planners full stop. Um, and, I mean, that's it, really. There's not enough planners full stop and there's certainly not enough good ones, yeah? Because they don't, they don't get paid enough. Um, for, for, one, for one thing, and it's a bit of a thankless task, really, and it's interesting. And, you know, there was a, a time earlier on in my career, um, <laughs> I, 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 I didn't love planners, right? That's just not, not you know, be, because they would make my life hard, yeah? And remember, and I've never really been a, a sort of like, 
arsehole developer that's just trying to do shit and cram too much on and doesn't care about things. Right? I've never been like that, right? Um, so, but nevertheless, you know, stuff would get get refused. Planners would backtrack on what they've told you. You know, it's it's difficult, right? That's that is that's it, it, that's just how it is, right? So for a long time, I didn't really love planners. Yeah, I guess as I probably started to understand things more in my later years and mellowed a bit as well, I've 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 started to see things for, from their point of view as as well, and and they got a really really difficult job actually because even if you uh let's just say you know you are a really good conscientious conscientious town planner and you got involved in planning because you wanted to help create better environments and you wanted to help more housing get created and stuff like that and you so you're you know you were sort of like let's say pro development obviously the right type of development not any old crap right if but so even if you were a good pro development planner right you would end up working for a local authority you could work closely with a developer for months, sometimes years, tweaking the scheme, negotiating the scheme, coming up with something between you all, working together collaboratively, which is how it should be, right? Um, you come up with something that ticks all the policy boxes, you're all happy with, yeah? You then recommend it to, to, for approval, it goes to a planning committee, and a whole load of untrained people, right? that don't get it, don't understand it, and are just massively influenced very often only by local politics and wanting to get voted in next time around, li- literally boot, boot it out on a whim after all your hard work. So you imagine that. So even as a, as a planner, how frustrating must that be? You know, the fact that you're, the, the, the people you're arguably serving, i.e. The, 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 the local community, and, and the councillors, even they don't value what you're doing, doing. So it's almost like, Jesus Christ, it's like, like, why bother? And then you get someone from the private sector, some private planning consultancy comes along and offers you three times as much. Like, not surprisingly, a lot of the best people are going to end up going there, yeah? So, so to actually stick with local authority planning after all of the grief they have to have, and not only that, right? And then, of course, you've got developers frustrated that are on their case as well, right? Sort of understandably to some extent when you've got hundreds, sometimes of thousands of pounds on the line, you know, it's, um, it's a bit of a thankless task really. So I, believe it or not, so I actually feel really sorry for local authority planners. I mean, they were talking about in the autumn budget as well, like more fast tracking services so that we can actually pay them a little bit more um, so that there's more money in the coffers to be able to increase. But then... I've heard of there are some council that have been trialing it, but they're at full capacity already anyway, so they're not taking any more of those applications because everybody wants to fast track it. So, I mean, it's, and then you've got, I think it's 13 different housing ministers in the last 13 years. There just seems to be no cohesive plan to be able to solve this. And now we've got things like Class MA, which are like ruining street. I, I mean, it just seems like a big mess. and. Uh, well, yeah, there seems to be no solution to it. It's 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 a it's a, it's a massive mess, and it, and it amazes me really, and particularly like the last few years, it makes me think it's like wow, some of the stuff that's been done, it's almost like, are they like trying to fuck it up on purpose? See, seriously, seriously, like the some of the ridiculous stuff that get that gets done, I'll tell you, right, about two years ago. I was invited to be on some consultation call with the housing minister at the time and a few other sort of like, you know, key people in the industry, some people from the HBF and stuff like that and the rest of it, right? And it, and it was meant to be, you know, the, you know, they're sort of like gauging our opinion and stuff like that, yeah? So we were, we were I mean, it's with the chief planner was on there as well. So, like, you know, all like high profile stuff, yeah? So I'm on this call, there's, about, there's probably about seven or eight of us in total, yeah? And... You know, they're sort of asking us stuff and we're telling them what we thought. And and clearly they'd already made their mind up. They weren't they weren't right. listening to what we said. It was clearly like a lip service thing, oh right, we've got to be seen to be consulting, right? And then and then and then their chief advisor at the time, I can't remember the guy the guy's name, but before the meeting I'd sort of gone away and checked him out on LinkedIn to see like like, you know, who, who is this bloke? And and he he was saying like about like twenty-five you know, out of Cambridge University, um, spent like four years working for some think tank, 
like guaranteed never been near a building site in his life and he was the guy that was that like he'd written this policy and, and like and I, it's like like really like what the fuck you've got people that have been doing it forever literally at the coal face like i've just told told, told you i probably had 10,000 meetings with landowners right probably i don't know you know probably and and like and i've been doing it for 39 years now i you know not just me lots of other experienced people as well you know we know what the problems are we know what needs to happen but you won't but they they won't that people people won't listen i mean just listen to the fucking people that are doing it and trying to make it work yeah because it is a complex complex business it isn't easy but look fucking leave it alone for long enough and we'll work it out yeah, all of this, like, you know, our policy needs to change, or it needs to complete rethink the planning system. It's like, no, just fucking leave it alone for long enough, yeah, and, and properly resource it, and we'll get it to work. And that is the problem for, basically, for literally for my whole career, um, all that's been hap happening is, is, you know, various governments have been moving the deck chairs around on the Titanic. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah, all yeah, it's yeah, been, yeah. and 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 it's because it's so so political. Hopefully now it's got to the point now that the housing crisis is so massive that it's starting to become a vote loser. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and and you know it looks like you know Labour if they get in seem to be making the right noises, um, but we'll see. You know. Yeah, I think it's about implementation. It makes sense that none of these people that they're employing as housing ministers seem to have any experience. So therefore, how can they make like fair judgment on it? it, it exactly. Because and, and the thing is, you know, it's a complex enough business when you when you when you you understand it, right? And, and and most of them, there's guaranteed there is no way they will get the intricacies. Even most so-called developers, certainly the newer ones, don't really, really, really get it. I mean, I know that. For, for, a, for a fact, because I end up training a lot of them. As you know, I've got another like property development training business, yeah? And um, so, yeah, it's like housing ministers, very few of them are, are really going to get it. And, of course, even if they did, they don't stay around for long enough anyway. I think that's the big problem, the revolving door. If you were offered the housing minister job, would you take it? This episode of Property People was brought to you by Merriox Property Finance. Merriox Property Finance is my company. I'm the managing director and founder. We launched August of last year. We provide finance for SME property investors and developers across the UK. Everything from bridging to development finance to whatever your exit might look like. If you're going to hang on to the properties from commercial term loans, buy to let, holiday lets, service accommodation, etc. We are investors, developers, landlords in the background. We have been lenders. We have been estate agents. So we very much know the value chain. We very much know what you go through, the highs and the lows, and we want to share them with you. So if you are uh, looking to make an investment, if you are looking to refinance something, if you are looking for funding for any of your property investments, please do reach out. We'd love to hear from you. Well, look, obviously... I'm curbing my swearing today, believe it or not, as you, as you know. So I don't think I'd be invited anyway. But yeah, absolutely. I would, I would literally, I would, I, I, would, I, would, I would love that job because, you know, I guarantee I could, I'd get it sorted. You know what? I, I sometimes question whether the people that are taking the job really want it or they're just getting a, you know, the title and, a, and then... As soon as they think this is not, I, I have no interest in this, and no, I've never wanted this job anyway. So then that's why they have this revolving door. But it's interesting. Somebody else I asked as well said very much a similar thing. You know, we're, we're property people that we surround ourselves with, and we want to be part of the solution. Um, so it doesn't surprise me with your answer. Now, one of the reasons why I like you so much as well, you're incredibly candid. Um, so and you've had all these successes not without having um, you know, a few hurdles and hoops to jump through along the way and uh, recessions and this, that, and the other. In your opinion, what is the biggest mistake you've made along the way? Well, look, there's been numerous, numerous, obviously. So I'll, te I'll tell you two, okay? These, the, the, these are my, my two, two biggest ones, yeah? So 2008... I had five, you know, reasonable-sized developments on the go. 
Four of them were funded by RBS. One of them was funded by Close Brothers. They were all really good deals because as they've always been like my, my, my usual model, right? All 100% off market, all sites where I added massive planning value. And on all of them as well, I had big chunks of my own equity in them, yeah, because I didn't want to be over leveraged and be borrowing too, too much money, right? So I thought that they were all really good, super safe deals, yeah? Obviously, what happened, happened, global financial crisis, banks run out of money, and uh, RBS literally pulled the plug on all my deals, yeah, not just mine, everyone's, right? A lot of people got seriously shafted by RBS. Yeah, yeah. Um, and pretty much, uh, I pretty much lost everything that I'd built up and, and sort of made over the previous 15 years, really, 10 years. And, um, and that was massively painful. RBS, uh, sorry, um, Close Brothers um, were the only ones that didn't pull the plug on me, stuck with me, got it done, everyone got paid back, made a few quid, all the rest of it. That's the only thing that really saved me. Yeah, like, so, so... Having too many eggs in one basket yeah. is, is definitely a mistake. Um, banking with RBS is definitely a mistake. Right? That still applies today, just so you know. <laughs> Can't go around shafting people the way they didn't expect to get away with it, right? Agree. No, no experienced developer that was around at the time. No one would go anywhere near fucking RBS or Nat, NatWest, right? Why, why would they? Um, conversely, you know, there are some good banks... Uh, Close Brothers being way, way up there in terms of like proper old school ethical work with you, like fantastic, yeah? So, so you know, you've got to be careful, I suppose, with who you work with is a short version, but and don't put all of your eggs in one basket. So that, that was obviously a big mistake. Um, interestingly as well, though, and, 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 and actually, and this is a weird one, and, I, and I, I don't know what to do about this. Like the fact that, you know, if I'd if I'd been like ninety five percent or more, you know, loan to cost or debt, you know, on on those deals, the bank it wouldn't have been so easy for RBS to pull the plug on me. Yeah, it's only the fact that I had so much value and so much equity in my deals. They obviously didn't want to, couldn't couldn't keep funding them because I'd run out of money. That made them easy for the to pull the plug. So in a weird way. By being too sensible and safe, it worked against me, yeah? What all that means, I don't know. I personally would still not get over leveraged. It just doesn't feel right, yeah, you yeah, know? Yeah, yeah. But, but, but that's, it's, it's, it's weird how it should have ended up that way when I thought I was doing the right thing, yeah? But anyway, that's history and that's, that's a lesson. Um, and the other lesson, the other big thing I wish I'd done is actually keep more of what I'd built. Yeah, because one of the, you know, what I did, I always wanted to do bigger and better deals and, and, and all the rest of it. I was very driven, like, there's another, another lesson actually linked to the ADHD thing. I realised I've always been a workaholic and addicted to deals. It's like, you know, and, and of course I loved what I did, right? So I wanted to be doing more of it all of the time. So what tended to happen is my, you know, my profit and my equity from one deal, well, so my profit from one deal became the equity for the next one, and then the next one, and the next one. And basically what happened is I went on doing, you know, more and bigger deals, which, of course, was fine until 2008 hit, yeah? Whereas in hindsight, what I wish I'd actually done is, 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 is kept more of what I built, yeah? And, and this is really interesting. I mean, most developers I talk to, certainly like old school ones and people I've known over the years, Ev, they all say the same thing. About 10 years ago now, I was semi-retired-ish. I lived in Spain. Um, I had a few little deals still on the go over here, but I was trying to slow down, yeah? And then um, I got really bored really quick. Yeah, I just, I couldn't, I couldn't slow down. I couldn't, I couldn't stop, yeah? <clears throat> Maybe and the ADHD? Now I know that... I, that is a thing, and that I've got it. Then, yeah, obviously, now you know it, make, it makes sense. Actually, I hadn't really thought about it. Yeah, but of course, I'm not going to be able to stop. You know, I've got a whole load of stuff going on in my head constantly. Yeah, <laughs> particularly around property development and deals. Yeah, so I tried to stop, but I couldn't. Got really, really, really bored. Um, so I'm still, you know, on the phone talking to people I know over, over, over here, and um, 
you know, I know a lot of people in the industry got pretty good at what I do. So I used to get people ringing me up all the time saying that like, oh, I've got a problem with planning, I've got a bit of a problem with my deal, what do you reckon, and all the rest of it, yeah? And because I was basically so bored and I didn't have any mates in Spain, I used to say to people, well, look, why don't you come over, stay at my place for a few days, and we'll, we'll have a look at it together, bring the drawings, you know, whatever, and all the paperwork, we'll sort it all out, yeah? So that, so that used to happen, people used to come over, used to, used to help them out with their deals, and, um, and have a few beers, which was nice, yeah? yeah. So anyway, so, so my um, partner at the time, you know, after a little while, she said to me, look, you've got all these people coming out all the time, you know, you're helping them out, out you're, you know, uh, you're helping them out and stuff. She said, well, you should, like, run a little training course. And I thought, actually, that's interesting. Like, you know, I'm, I'm bored, obviously. I haven't ever done anything like that before. That would be quite interesting. So I thought, yeah, actually, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll try that. So anyway, so, so I, I put together a little course, um, did a little talk somewhere in the UK, told a few people I was going to be doing it. A load of people got interested. And I think I had about eight people like came to Seville, which is where I was living at, at the time. I ran this training course, right? Went, went, went really well. And, and probably two thirds of those people are, are actually, um, and most of them were just sort of like small scale or even investors wanting to get into develop, development. Um, probably two thirds of those have, have actually done quite well. So they're actually building quite a lot of houses now. So that's, that's really, really good. So anyway, and then it sort of went on from, from there because I'm like super detailed and I want to, everything to be perfect and stuff like that, I thought, right, okay, I'm, I'm going to make this even better and I'm going to do it again, yeah? So, so, but of course, I'd got to, when it came to teaching it, it was like, it was a bit of a struggle really because, you know, for example, you know, you put a scheme in front of me, you put a site in front, like, like you know, show me an OS map or whatever or, you know, little something on, on Land Insight. Um, I'll pretty much know the answer straight away. Like, like you know, it, what, what, will it get planning? Won't it get planning? What's the best scheme? What's the best mix? What are the constraints? You know, all the stuff that you need to know to, to come up with a best scheme. I, I just largely know that from, it, from experience. Yeah? Obviously, that you've got to get into a whole load of detail as things go on, but I, I pretty much know just by looking at it, right? And of course, that's the whole unconscious um, competence bit, yeah? But of course, when it's like, you know, and sometimes people put a scheme in front of me and I literally, you know, say, well, that's not a deal, is it? And I say, well, what do you mean it's not a deal? I've just, I've just paid three million quid for that. <laughs> and I'll say, oh, dear. Right? And they say, well, why is, why is it? And I say, well, because they're like this, this, and this, and this. And they're like, oh, shit. You know? And obviously, it's not always that way. Hopefully, most of the time, people realise their mistakes before they've gone and done it, yeah? But... But I realised I didn't, I'd forgotten, I didn't know how I did what I did. i have been doing it for so long. I, but, so when it came to like teaching it and explaining it, I thought, wow, I'm going I'm to have to sort of like break this down. And that was a, like a really useful exercise, yeah. So I sort of like looked at every deal I've done, every, for myself and for obviously the big PLCs that I used to work for, all the really good deals that I've seen done by other people, all the really bad ones as well. And basically like reverse engineered, st uh, step by step, everything I'd, I'd learned to sort of create a little system to help teach it to other people, yeah? And I called it, like came up with a little bit of an acronym for people to remember, I called it the insider system, right? Because it's basically, you know, like the insider knowledge that most people don't know and the few people that do know it don't actually want anyone else to know it, yeah? So it really is, it's proper industry insider, you know, knowledge and the best way of doing things, in my opinion, yeah? So anyway, so I, I tell you that because it's basically, it's designed to solve the biggest problems and the mistakes that I see most developers make. Um, and, it's, and it's been this way in my, all my career, right? So it's not, not a new thing, right? So the, the biggest problems are, remember it spells inside, right? They can't identify the right sites, yeah? So basically, they are messing around with stuff that, are, that is either on or in the market, yeah? They're not proper real off-market deals, which means they're up against it before they've even started. Yeah, so that's, that's the biggest mistake, yeah? When they're looking at deals, they can't quickly navigate the potential, i.e. work out is it a deal or isn't it a deal without wasting a whole load of time and money. Yeah, so that's a, you know, like I just told you a little story. The amount of time I see people well and truly involved in a deal, sometimes they've even bought it and it doesn't work. 
it, it's like it happens a lot, right? And I, I guarantee you, you in like finance, right? You must see it. I, I yeah, guarantee yeah, yeah. people sticking stuff in front of you that just doesn't work. 100%, 100%, yeah? 100% all the time. So, so anyway, so they can't quickly nav- work it out and navigate the potential. Then if and when they find something that might be a deal, they don't know how to negotiate it and secure it on the very best terms, yeah? Now, in my opinion, the very best terms mean an option agreement and ideally a one pound option agreement. Yeah, so that's 90% of my deals literally for the last 30 years have been one pound option agreements. Ever since I discovered that book, Big Profits from Building Plots, yeah, which is basically that's what that was all about, that's been my way of doing things. Yeah, because, you know, even if you've got, you know, let's say you can slap down five million quid unconditionally to buy something, why would you if you can tie it up on an option and ideally a one pound option? Yeah. yeah, so yeah. so there's all different ways of, of, of doing deals and securing deals, but most people don't know how to do it in the right way, yeah, in the best way, right? So that's uh, <clears throat> in INS. I, and this is this is probably this is probably the most important bit in a lot in a, in a lot of ways. The I stands for instruct, yeah. So and and it's really about how you come up with the scheme that's going to maximise the land value because obviously it's maximise knowing how to maximise the land value is what persuades the landowner to do a deal with you yeah so how do you create a bit as big an uplift as possible over and above the existing use value yeah the bigger uplift you can create the more there is to share around right so maximising the land value which at the same time maximises your profit is really the the, the absolute skill. Of, of a really good developer, yeah? And it's, and, and it's I for instruct because it is our job, right, to instruct all of the professional team, right? It's definitely not called ask, yeah? So you don't, like, you know, you, you don't become a super successful developer by, by asking a planning consultant and asking an architect and doing what they say, right? Because they, they don't know, right? If they knew everything that needs to be done and known, that'd be us, right? They'd they be, be the developer. It, they'd be doing it themselves. Of, of course, of course. So, so... Which is also, very quickly, how I lost £20,000 by asking an architect and an planning consultant, thinking that they knew what they were talking about, and, uh, and it turns out we couldn't get the three units at the back of this mixed-use freehold. To- totally. Like, literally, happens all the time. And you obviously, you're lucky that you only lost 20 grand because I see a lot of people losing a lot, lot, lot more than that, yeah? Because, you know, absolutely, you know, we need good architects, we need good planning um, consultants. They're a really important part of our t- team, right? But someone needs to manage the process. That's what we get the big money for, right? Yeah. It's like overseeing things, knowing how it all fits together, yeah? So we brief and instruct the team. It, we then all work together, but, w- you know, look we get the big money for having the big ideas and the big knowledge and the big balls as well, to be honest, right? But but that's it. So it, it instructs, knowing how to come up with the very best scheme is absolutely like key, 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 yeah? Now, after the I is obviously D, the D is for drive, and that's all about driving the planning process, Yeah. Because, you know, you can, whilst you can design and come up the, with the right scheme on paper that maximises the land value and profit for you, right? If you can't actually get planning permission for it, well, it's all relevant, isn't it? It means, it means nothing, yeah? So, so, so coming up with the right scheme actually means coming up with the right scheme that's going to get planning and then knowing how to get planning. So those two things are, are, are linked, really, yeah? So knowing how to drive the planning process is, is, is absolutely key. Now... And, and most people don't know how to do that. They're, they're all a little bit passive and reactive. Like, you know, do a pre-app, see what the planners say, submit a planning application, and then, like, wonder why it's taking forever and you, they're changing their minds and moving the goalposts, et cetera, et cetera, right? That's not how it works. And you've told me before as well that you don't really, not a big fan of pre-apps. Well, I, I, I am and I'm not. I tell you, what I'm not a big fan of is, is like, a lot, lots of people, they think... The reason for doing pre-apps is because the planners are going to tell them what they can do. Yeah. Now the planners generally they won't tell you what you can do. They'll tell you what you can't do, right? And 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 a, a, a bit like it's not a bit like your own architect and planning consultant won't give you all the answers. The local authority planner definitely won't give you the answer, right? Their job is not to maximise land values and get deals done, right? So 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 whilst it's useful, so as as part of 
it might be useful as part of your overall planning strategy. So just for, for your info as well. So all of these, these top level steps inside, her, right? There's about five to seven sub steps below those of the, of the exact things that you need to do, yeah? So when it comes to driving the planning process, the, the sub acronym is called STEER. Number one part of the process is coming up with your planning strategy. What I would do in, is different for different types of sites, different for different local authorities, different with different types of landowners. So it's never one size fits all. So in, in actual fact, I suppose that's another big mistake that people make is like thinking they just do the same thing all the time, right? So you've got to come up with your planning strategy. Sometimes a pre-app is the right thing to do. Sometimes it isn't. The key thing to remember is, is you're not... If and when I do pre-apps, right... It's either part of my overall planning strategy, because I know I'm going to be appealing anyway, and I want to be seen to have tried to do everything the right way, i.e. negotiate it, or it will be because there's a few little grey areas that I want to nail the planners down and get them to put in writing how they're interpreting it or what what right. they think it means. So I'm, I'm just literally, literally I'm, usually I'm trying to nail them down on a few details, right? I'm not asking them the answer because <laughs> they haven't got the answer. And even if they did that, they wouldn't tell you anyway, right? So, that, so that's why it's not like I don't like pre-apps. It's just most people don't use them the right Correct way. And, and they give them a lot more value than they do because ultimately, I'm sure you probably know, pre-apps not really worth the paper it's written on anyway. Yeah, because I got one and, it, and exactly didn't work out for me. Exactly, exactly. It's that, that's what happens. So, so after instructing the right scheme, driving the planning process to come up with the get plan, ultimately get planning permission for the thing that's going to maximise the land value. That's really where we're trying to get to. Once you've got planning, then you can, you know, depending on your your you know relationships you've got and what exits you're interested in. That's what the E and R is. R, 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 afterwards, there's key stuff that you need to do there around finding the best contractors, the best finance, a whole load of other stuff. Obviously, whether you're building to sell or building to rent or whatever, um, maybe doing JVs with landowners is one of my favourite things. Yeah, that, that that might affect what you do earlier on in the process. Sure. Reverse but, engineer it. Yeah, everything's reverse engineered, right? But ultimately, ultimately, what we're really trying to do is get a planning permission because once you got to that point, you've, you've added a load of value, yeah, if, you, if you've done it or done it right. And, um, and my, most people... Don't do it right. So you know, I and like I say, I'm super, 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 super detailed. Touch wood, I, I've got like 100% tr track record of planning. Yeah, I've never ultimately not one planning. Uh, probably 20, 25% of those I've had to appeal to win, but usually I've known that that's the case from the from the start. Uh, you know, planning, you know, to win, you know, go to appeal and win it is part of my planning strategy, right? Because I know very often that's the way it's going to work out. Now, days, probably more so than ever, just because the system's in such disarray, yeah? So, so I suppose in short, just to summarise that, the mistakes people make, right? That they're not finding the best deals, yeah? They're wasting a whole load of time and money not knowing how to quickly assess them, yeah? They're not negotiating them, tying them up on the right terms, yeah? They're overly relying on architects and planning consultants, thinking that they're going to give them all the answers. They're not going to give them all the answers. We need to know and learn this stuff. That's, we, we get the big money for adding, knowing how to add the value. Um, and then that's basically linked to knowing how to negotiate um, and win the very best planning permission as quickly as possible, yeah? And most people don't know how to do it and they balls it all up, which is, um, that's where they go wrong. And you know, so, I mean, you've, you've, you're in the education space, you've in the training space, you've helped some really successful developers, award-winning developers. They're still going strong today. Um, you've even been a lecturer at South Bank University. Um, so, I mean, you are good at this uh, training. I've been on this training course. I've literally done, I think, one training course, and it's been yours. Um, and it's beca because I've been so compelled by the way that you approach everything, the passion and the detail. Um, how do you get the time to be able to do the property development, site finding, and and the mentorship. And then this whole kind of um, wave of technology that you're getting more and more involved in, is that something that you're putting online or is it, uh, are you thinking about doing still kind of one-to-one -one training? Because I know you've been on site for the last 24 months. How are you thinking about managing all that? Yeah, well, well, 
obviously the ADHD and the workaholism helps. <laughs> yeah. But I am trying to curb that. Now I know I've got it. But um, yeah, so so the the training business I started, like I say, ten ten years ago, and and that was that's that's good, right? It was it was it's it was fun. I like it. I like having a laugh. Um, I like working with good people. I, I like. I really want to help more good housing um, get created. Yeah, not and and that actually changed the perception of property development and property developers because it's like you know one one of the big problems with the system overall is is and the politics of it is you know there's still a view that you know property developers are all assholes, right? So like. You may or may not know, I'm into sort of all sorts of weirdo hippie stuff, right, that I don't really talk that much about. But in that world, I don't tell people what I do. because I'm, I'm a bit, like, embarrassed to be a property developer because I'm assuming that they think, like, I'm just some greedy arsehole, yeah? So, but I'm not, right? And there's a better way of doing it. So I, the sooner more people know how to do it the right way, i.e. developers, you know, do all of the stuff that I've just talked about, and, and that make a ton of money because there's absolutely nothing wrong with that, right? We are doing a really complicated, risky job. We we deserve to make a fuckload of money. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely, we Adding do. So right? much value. Well, totally, we're the guys that do the hard work, you, you know, and put our what's it's on the line to 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 create much needed housing and commercial space for people, right? So we definitely need to be well rewarded because it's so risky, right? So. Um, I can't even remember what, what I'm banging on about now. <laughs> How do you manage to pack it all in? And what, uh, with the training, is it going to be online? Or is it um, is it going to be uh, in person? Um, you've just come off site for 24 months. Yeah, right. So, so what? How I did, do you pack it all in? I used to do all live training. We probably used to run about we used to, sort of one a month. Yeah, so I sort of had like a one-day training, which was about finding off-market development sites. And then I, I had what was a, th- a three days worth of training about how you do all the next bit, you know, work out what you can do with them, yeah. tie them up on the best terms, et cetera, et cetera, right? And then during lockdown, we um, uh, did it all online. We sort of did these hybrid events where we broadcast them and we recorded them, yeah? So I now basically got all of my training digitally online. <laughs> but... I've not really been putting it out there or marketing it or selling it just because I've been busy doing other stuff. And it's not my main main business, right? So um, now that I've just finished probably one of my major projects that's kept me busy for the last couple of years, well, I'll actually start putting it out there again and we'll, you know, I'll start running a few live courses as well. Because like I say, they are, you know, I do, I do quite enjoy them. So, so that's that. Um, Why do you think that um, in the education space, especially in property, that you get a lot of gurus and this sort of thing, they get a lot of bad stick? Well, because to be honest, a lot of them are arseholes. Aren't they? Really? (laughs) You know, there's a whole ton of bullshitters out there. It's like, you know, and it's all like get rich quick. They fucking don't know what they're doing. They tell lies. You know, look, if, if... me talking about property development not being easy, right, is like, that, that's not the way to sell it. You know, if I could be out there, picture of me laying naked on the bonnet of my Ferrari, telling people how they're all going to be millionaires in six months, you, you know, that would sell a whole load of stuff, but it's just not true, right? So, so you know, telling the truth, actually, <laughs> it's not very good for sales. Hence, most of the people out there are just bullshitters and... and um, you know, the vast majority of them don't even know what they're doing anyway. So. Yeah, selling the dream, but not necessarily actually the reality, which is a, a bit of a nightmare. <laughs> can be. It can be, yeah. So in terms of um, the best bit of advice that you've ever received, what is the best bit of advice that you've ever received? What would you say? Wow, best bit of advice. Well, I, d- I don't know if this is the best bit of advice, but, I d- but I'll tell you a couple of things. Something's just sprung to mind. I haven't really thought about this before. When I, you know, I, st- I told you my light story, I started off in construction, yeah? I was a trainee site engineer, and then I was a site engineer, then I was a trainee site manager, and then I was a site manager. So by the time I was 22, um, I was site manager on little sites, yeah, for, for some of the firms that, I, w- that I, was, I was working for, whilst, remember, still doing increasingly slightly bigger development stuff, yeah? And um, 
And quite early on, someone I was working for basically said, look, when, when it comes to construction, you, if you've got to get it, and this is new build construction I'm talking about, right? You've got to get it right in the ground. If you don't mm. get it right in the ground, then you'll never pull it back. Yeah, so, so I thought, well, that's interesting. And it actually made a lot of sense. So I then went and spent about four years. But so when I was 22, I ran a little, I was managed a little groundwork company. Yeah, so, right. I, so I thought, actually, that's, that, I, I need to fucking really understand this stuff, right? So, so when it comes to construction, you've got to get it right in the ground. I suppose that's an interesting little lesson. And, and at some point, I also realised or came to learn that everything starts with land. Yeah, so then that's when I thought, right, okay, I need to make myself a bit of a land expert and study all of this stuff. So that's why I decided to go and, you know, learn to be a land buyer, yeah? So, and I think, and that all totally holds true. I mean, there's, I don't think there's no one experience in development that would argue with those two things. Um, there's there's, there's, there's going to be a whole ton of other stuff. Um, but those sound like, yeah, the, where the biggest risks are and then the rewards as well that come from it. If you can mitigate those risks in the ground and through the planning system, then you're going to be able to hopefully benefit from those big rewards. Yeah, yeah. Um, what would you say is the worst piece of advice that you've ever received? The worst piece of advice, wow. Do you know what? Like, th this... God, for various reasons, well, I'm, I'm, I'm going to have to tell you this because I can't, I can't really answer the question without telling you this. So basically, so, so you know, like I said, I, I, my whole career, right, or my whole life, actually, I've really been into personal development and, and property development. Yeah, now the reason that I was into per, got into personal development is because since really young, right, I... I I thought, I thought there was something wrong with me, right? Now, of course, I know ADHD. There really was fucking something wrong with me after all. I did, I, I did say that it wasn't. I wasn't just imagining it, right? So that was one thing. But, you know, and all the time I was into the personal development stuff, I, I mean, I've, I've, like, literally done, you know, I, like, I, was, I was an NLP master, master practitioner 30 years ago, right? The amount of stuff, courses, psychology, weirdo stuff, hypnotherapy, you know, I'm a trained, like, psychotherapist and hypnotherapist, right? And the whole load of stuff lots of people don't know, right? Because I was, like, basically trying to understand and fix myself, yeah, and work out, shit, what's wrong with me? How do I, you know, what's wrong with me? How do I, how do I sort myself out, right? So, you know, and I've done a lot of interesting stuff. And that, and, and, and that stuff's probably been really helpful, actually, when it came to negotiating with people as well sure, and, and getting deals imagine. done, yeah? But a lot of that stemmed from um, when I was about four years old, my mum told me I was adopted, yeah? And, and now, you know, piecing things together and all the rest of it, I realised I actually never trusted anyone yeah so that's one of the reasons and actually adoption is a real massive correlation between adoption adopted people and adhd yeah, I, so yeah, yeah. i recently learned for a load of reasons i won't bore you with so that was a real eye, eye, eye opener as well but but i now realize i basically didn't trust anyone so that's one of the reasons like all of the stuff in property development like construction law planning architecture all of these things I, whatever someone told me I, would, I, would, I, w I was never really sure whether I could believe them. So I had to go and learn it myself, right? Now, that's been good in a lot of ways because I've learned a lot of detailed stuff which I've applied to deals and has made me successful. But actually, also, it, was, it would have definitely held me back big time as well because I haven't trusted people and I've literally tried to do everything on my own. We, and it doesn't matter whoever or however clever you may or may not be or think you are you can't do everything on your yeah. own yeah so you've done so, incredibly well you know in spite of that yeah but it's all i love, I love it it's all an interesting learning yeah, experience yeah. isn't it hopefully we're all learning and growing every day you know exactly. and um it's a it's a it's an interesting life isn't it you are um by any standard a successful property person this show is called property people um, for anybody that's wanting to start out or, or grow in, in this industry, what sort of traits do you think, characteristic, uh, characteristic traits do you think are important to have to be successful in property? Well, I mean, 
I, I'll only talk about prop, property development, yeah, because I'm, I'm no real expert in you know, investment or anything else, yeah? But in terms of property development, um, the way I've done it anyway, right, you know, you've, you've, you've got to be detailed, you've got to be thorough. Um, I, you've got to be driven because it's not, it, honestly, it isn't easy. You've got to be resilient. You've got to not give up easy. Um, I personally think you, you've got to be massively creative, actually. It's really interesting also this whole thinking back recently about you know, what I used to like at school, art, right? Property development is, in a lot of ways, it's pretty much the most creative thing you can do. I think so anyway. You know, you think about the whole world, the built environment around us is to large extent. And every development is completely different based on all of the different elements all around you and how you've got to deal with yeah, all the Yeah, totally. And I'll tell you one final, I have a little interesting thing. It's one of, one of, one of the things I've sort of learned over the years is, is a lot of architects that I've met, and I know loads of really excellent ones, yeah, and a lot of them are my, are my mates, at one level, they end up sort of wanting to be property developers because they actually realise that's the best way they can get their ideas off the drawing board, basically, because it doesn't, you know, you can have all of these great ideas, but if you don't know how to make it all happen, they, yeah, they, they, yeah, they, they yeah. don't happen, yeah? And, and, and a lot of really good developers, I've found, actually, probably in their heart of hearts, actually want or wanted to be architects because they just really want, they like design, they like buildings, and they want to get good stuff created, you know? And there's actually a, a breed of a uh, developer that literally just gets planning on the stuff, and that's all they want to do. They don't really want to build anything out. They just want to get the. And I, and I know pretty. Uh, I know one particular where they specialise in small sites uh, and like backland sites and stuff, but very very individual, unique type developments. Uh, and that's what just uh, that's their their niche, and that they stick to it. And it's got kind of a very artistic, creative mindset and approach to it. Paul, if people wanted to find you and reach out to you and connect with you and uh, find out more about these training programs, um, how, how, what's the best way that they can do that? So obviously people can check me out on um, LinkedIn. That's uh, I'm there. And I've got to say, here's another little, final little tip for you. The whole amount of people out there doing training and stuff and all the rest of it, it's really simple. Go and check them out on LinkedIn. See like you know, how long have they been doing it? What have they done? I mean, that's like anyone you want to work with, really, yeah, isn't it? Like, exactly. We'll have a real look at their CV, yeah? So, no, find me on LinkedIn, or um, in terms of the training business, that's called Millbank Land Academy. So um, just Google that, go there, and, um, you know, you can get hold of us that way as well. And I'll make sure all of the links are in the show notes as well. Cool, 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 cool. Thank you so much for joining us. I hope to catch up with you again. Thanks, mate.